Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is your host, Guillermo Sabatier on Perspectives on Energy, and uh, welcome to today's show. Today we'll be discussing inverter-based resources and uh, new NERC regulations. So uh, once again, I'm the uh, Director of uh, International Services for HSI, the Health and Safety Institute, Industrial Skills. And uh, we recently covered this. Uh, um, he's not with us today. My my uh, my colleague, Jim Stanton, and I covered this uh, earlier this week with uh, with an earlier webinar. But uh, definitely, um, we want to discuss what has happened right, with these changes. And they've been coming for a while. Uh, it was... It was uh, some of the new standards that NERC is putting up where they've lowered the threshold for some of these like renewable resources, right? Namely, uh, solar or the wind. In the past, it's always been 75 megawatts or below. Usually you see them running at 74.9 and they would build them to that spec or they would just limit their output to that spec. And really all, all that was, was to uh, avoid, for example, compliance, violation, exposure risk, right? Now, that, you know, we're going to discuss that today as far as, you know, when they make a business decision with a, with a, with a wrong perception of what that risk is. And we'll talk about, you know, what the kind of help that exists out there. We'll talk about what the steps are. We'll talk about uh, there's no need to be afraid because it's not that hard. And there's plenty of help available. Inverter-based resources for regulatory, regulatory changes. But we'll talk about the efficient and cost-saving strategies, right, for these NERC compliance programs. I mean, uh, we help quite a lot of clients doing that, and, and but there are many others. We're not the only ones that actually do that. Um, I've been working on NERC compliance for a very long time as well in my career. I've, uh, I mean, NERC standards have been around since after the 2003 blackout, right? So by, before that, they were called NERC policies. And yes, they had uh, they had audits and audits, but you know the they but they never really implemented those standards. Or the they went from policies to standards, and yes, they 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 had a uh, violation penalties, right, where they could be as bad as a million dollars per infraction per day. But the truth is, right, for these smaller generator owners, generator operators, I've never really seen that kind of uh, that a violation, and much less seen that kind of like penalty imposed on a generator. So just why, again, I emphasize, right? It's not as bad as people first think, and, and it's terrible when they make a business decision just limiting their output merely for, for the idea that, you know, they have, uh, the risk is just too great. And that, that, that just tells me that they don't have a full understanding of what their risk is, or they have zero understanding of what their, uh, what the compliance requirements are, or whether they'll be able to meet them or not. So hopefully there's many ways to do that today. All right, so standards, right? Is it risk, routine, or both, right? And one of the things we need to look at it is when the most important thing, and I'll skip down to the bottom, right, is preparation is key, right? So so you have uh, a lot of advanced warning, right, before any standard becomes effective. And, and how they apply to these inverter-based resources. Well, you know, for example, uh, uh, on the ones that are applicable to these standards, right, there will... It's good news is that now there's enough of you out there on the grid that you're creating at times a reliability risk. So that sounds bad, but at the same time, it tells me that you have saturated the market full of generator operators that now NERC has his hands full. Granted, the more the more entities they they have to like uh, keep tabs on and they have to like uh, follow up and 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 look to see that you're following compliance the longer it'll be before you actually get called up on to do that. But at the same time, right, it's understanding what your what your obligations are as these standards become applicable to you, right? So mind you, NERC has been around for, since right after the, that, that 2003 blackout. So they've been around for a while. And they, they normally uh, apply to uh, larger utilities, co-ops, that sort of thing, and, and then usually uh, entities that, that had facilities 100 kV or above or 75 megawatts or higher. Well, now this is all changed, right? When it comes to these uh, these types of renewable resources. So the threshold's gotten a lot lower and uh, so has the voltage. So now you're going to find yourself right in a situation where you are now subject to standards. Um, if you already have an existing asset, uh, well, now it's, now it's going to wrap, it. these standards will now involve you. Uh, so, how do you manage this, right? Cost and effectiveness, right? As I said earlier, 
preparation is key, right? And, and a lot of that involves having all your, documenta all your documentation, which I think for the most part, you already do. At some point or another, you had to do a interconnection agreement with your local transmission owner, transmission operator, or the balancing area. You probably have to do a lot of submit. Well, do carry out and submit a lot of system studies. Uh, you have to submit, for example, all your all your line line impedances, all your uh, protection settings. I mean, you do have equipment in your that's going to protect your your side of the uh, of the asset, right? You 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 already have relaying and system protection that that you have in place to protect your asset. So in a lot of cases, these are already meet compliance anyway. And if not, there's a possibility, right, where you you can change that to 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 fit these new uh, ride through capability requirements. And if not, if you are stuck with something you bought before these things changed, well, you all you have to do is make a declaration that hey, I don't have the ability to make settings that allow for a ride through but and that's fine too right so these are just examples right the other thing is uh, making sure you have documentation you're making sure you have um all your evidence and audits for example don't need to be as scary so here's what you don't want to do in uh when it comes to these like uh compliance requirements and resources, right? You don't want to limit your facility in order to avoid these standards. If you have like a facility that's rated 80 megawatts and 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 I've seen entities that that that, that will run it at 74.9 because they didn't want to they, they were willing to forego those extra five, six megawatts of, of of sales revenue just to avoid this perceived risk of compliance, right? So so these wrong approaches, right? It's and I understand they're making a business decision based on risk perception, but in reality, that perception is is probably incorrect, right? Uh, the other thing is, for example, your o, your OEMs and all your EPC contractors, right? So when you install these 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 sites, you're going to have contractors that do all of the facility ratings for your conductors. You're going to have uh, protection and control contractors that are going to install and test all of your relays. You're going to have an engineering firm that's going to actually do a fault study on all of your equipment, right? So that's just a switch chart. On the actual uh, generating facility, right, on the inverter, there's going to be settings in there that is already, is for the most for the most part, right, a lot of them going back five, six years, they have the capability to do what they call ride through, whether it's a frequency excursion, voltage excursion or even be able to ride through a certain fault that's happening out, out, far off in your system right so these are the things that you need to understand right to be able to set that up and it's, it's not hard to do right so in a lot of cases all of these like specs that were given to you upon commissioning usually are they have a lot of value don't lose those of course but you know that those are the things that you probably already submitted anyway to your to your RTO or your TOP or all or your balancing authority, the you know, the entities you were you were connecting to in your interconnection agreement, right? Okay, so the other thing, uh, you don't want to try and figure it out later. If you're going to become online, you're a new facility, right? And you're now coming online during during this period that you are now experiencing the fact that you're now subject to all these standards. Don't in your rush to meet that deadline to come online and start producing megawatts to then decide no we'll find a lot of compliance evidence later no you need to like think about that before you energize everything and the reason being is that it's easier to delay a project and make sure you have everything in place rather than finding out during an audit right that uh because one thing the auditors don't like is, is is to know that you made a deliberate decision to ignore compliance just to make just to like make revenue so uh, they are more willing to probably, in my experience, probably like uh, let it slide with a warning if you just had an oversight, as opposed to them finding out that you decided to to forego your compliance process just to make, be on schedule for something. So that, that's a definitely not not a thing to do, right? When it comes to compliance, so don't try and figure it out later. Get that figured out ahead of time before you're commissioned or energized for the first time, right? Uh, oh, again, my second bullet, why is the facilities up and running before focusing on reliability considerations? No, that's that again, that's something you don't want to do. You want to ha have that already managed and looked at way ahead of way ahead of energization, right? Usually in the very beginning stages, right, of actually like scoping this out, doing some of the engineering studies. When you have your settings, when you're testing these relays, 
that you're going to need to, for example, run run this the site, or whether it's a switch chart, or it's the inverter based resource protection, right? There's settings that go in there that are are specific requirements on writing out a disturbance, whether it's a frequency excursion, a voltage, or writing out during during an issue with a, a line fault zone, right? So they're not that bad, but at the same time, you have to make sure those settings are in there and tested, and you have evidence of those tests that they were successful. So the way ahead of energization, right? Uh, what's next? Uh, assume your viable resource status contributes less reliability than other technologies. So here's the thing, right? Uh, maybe five, six years ago, that may have been true, but right now there are so many renewable resources and so much variability that you are impacting the grid in such a way that NERC is now definitely looking at what's happening, that they had to change their, uh, they had to expand their scope of uh, standards and, and applicability, which now includes these uh, inverter-based resources. So, yeah, you're you're. So the good news is there's a lot of you now. So, so uh, take that to heart. Um, what's next? Keeping reliability considerations a side item to be addressed when the time is available. Uh, no, once again. The uh, compliance is important and planning is key. You don't want to do this at the uh, as an afterthought or then try and catch up later because believe me, you're going to have problems. Uh, whenever you try and do this after the fact, you end up not finding evidence, which is a bad thing because and then the, the auditor will know that you know you just didn't do this up front. And the, you, you you're better off you're better off getting all this ready ahead of time before you try and go back and by all with God and just don't ever, ever, ever try and create evidence or write at the station saying, I hereby declare a test that this is compliant because it's going to be an issue. Um, so again, most of the contractors, contractors that you hire to actually commission all these sites are going to be pretty well versed on uh, providing documentation and, 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 and carrying out testing that is according to these NERC standards, PRC-5, PRC-25, FRC-8. Uh, all these standards are really, really important, and they're they're often violated. So, for, But again, these uh, these uh, contractors are re really pretty well-versed on this, and, and if not, then you need to find a different contract. Um, what else? Fail to integrate reliability considerations into the routine process. So part of that is the... Uh, day to day operations, right? In your operating procedures, in your in the way you conduct business, in the way you operate this particular asset, right? Yeah, uh, reliability is is a crucial aspect. And the reason that these standards are in place is because they want to ensure reliability. They want to make sure that your your asset, along with thousands of other assets out there, are not going to cause uh, a, a major system disturbance that will eventually lead to a blackout, which means you won't be able to produce revenue anyway if you're blacked out. So that's the other thing that they want to make sure that 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 you don't do. So do not fail to integrate reliability considerations, right? So, and I, again, that is something that you can implement, integrate, right, with your procedures. And when you write a procedure correctly, it doesn't have to be that long, uh, you already can bake in compliance already in there. So you want to make sure your operating procedures are compliant. You don't want to try and, you, and create a compliance procedure that you're going to force your op operating personnel to try and use. So remember, operating procedures should be compliant, not try and make a, 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 a compliance-friendly procedure to kind of retrofit it to, to, to make it friendly to operators. All right, so uh, here's the thing, right? Now that you're, that you're, that you're, these standards apply to you, right? Uh, being part of, being a registered entity, right? The good news is that now you have the ability to be able to vote on some of these standards. You have the ability, you have a say, you have, uh, there. there's value, for example, in being part of that registered ballot body, right? Uh, the other thing is, you know, there's also value in, in, in your contribution as an entity, meaning a generator owner or generator operator. So you're gonna have the ability to actually uh, contribute to whether these standards are are applicable are so most of these standards go through like a process in which you know they several years right where they they vote on it and at that point you have the ability to make changes or to even vote on some of these changes right so remember standards are part of normal operations right and and part of that is for example cybersecurity is something that is very important and something you, you're probably already doing right uh cybersecurity is a threat to everyone uh some some of them are are, are a more uh, juicy target than others 
But as generator operators are out there more and more, there's, there's going to be a definite risk. And one of the things that's the biggest risk of all, really, it, it, it's your it's your cybersecurity. Right? The other thing that's important, and it goes hand in hand with cybersecurity, is protection system operations, right? So a lot of these relays are network connected. So that's one of the things that 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 also comes into play. So again, understanding that type of like cybersecurity risk is something you're you're going to do anyway with business, right? So it's a matter of like paying attention to how you do that. And making sure that it's compliant and that you have evidence, right, that you did that. So, okay, again, not that bad. The other interesting thing about this is that with NERC, everything is transparent, right? You're not going to have any, there's no, there should not be any surprises. You're going to know years ahead of time when there's a change to a standard, a requirement, a, a criteria, and they even give you the rationale behind why they're making those changes. And as a stakeholder, right, being part of the ballot body, you you will have a chance to vote or write comments on some of these. So that that's another really great benefit of being as being a registered entity. So you have a lot of like buy-in, and you and you have uh, input into how this happens. So again, with NERC, there's there's nothing hit, right? Once you're a registered entity, you get to see everything. Also, there's another resource, right? The the North American Transmission Forum which is made up of all your peers, all of your GOs and GOPs, and all of you help each other when it comes to dealing with NERC compliance. Nobody, There's no vendors and there's no NERC personnel allowed in that forum. So it's just U.S. peers. Now, when I used to work on the utility side, I was a rep, a rep for, for, for my organization, right? Uh, my utility. And I, I get to have a lot of important information on there. I had peer reviews uh, sometimes where the peers would come in and, and kind of like review what I was doing and get me ready for an audit or they would critique my process. So again, that's another great asset to have, right? So you're not alone in this and you can get a lot of help. <clears throat> Ultimately, there's entities like us, right? They can come in and help you with a complete end-to-end -end compliance service or there's others that can that can help you with you know, advising here and there when it comes to NERC. Next slide, please. So bearable burdens, right? So here's the thing we talked about. As a registered entity, right? This is not that bad. Uh, evidence documentation. You're going to be able to. Um, it's just a matter when they ask me how many hours a month it takes. Once you got it up and running, and you have your compliance program up and running with your facilities, right, or your assets, or you have your system. <clears throat> From what we've seen, it's about eight to twelve hours a month, maybe six to eight hours a month on your ongoing compliance duties, and that's really it, it's. It's about making sure that you have your 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 compliance documentation or your evidence properly stored, labeled, and ready. Uh, <clears throat> also, keeping an eye, looking looking ahead, looking forward on that uh, compliance landscape, right? And you get notifications all the time. Right? We're saying, hey, uh, there's a meeting this th this month regarding you know this new standard is, is that may come into effect three years from now. So you get plenty of that information. The other thing is, of course, being ready, right? Uh, being ready for audits. Ideally, if an audit is announced, you're going to have maybe eight to ten months, you know, or six months at the worst, right, to be to be ready for that audit thing. If you run your audit, your compliance program correctly, an audit can happen tomorrow, and it shouldn't matter because you have everything up to date. All of your compliance evidence is up to date, and they give you usually an audit period of like maybe eighteen months to a year, meaning from this day looking back, right. So, so uh, ideally, you should have had that all that ready. And so, a good compliance program, you'll be updating everything, basically uh, uh, from a day-to-day -day basis. So, an audit could, could you could have a spot check today, and you'll be fully compliant if you did your job right. The other interesting thing as well is that um, there's a there's a, a a form called the Reliability Standards Audit Worksheet. So in our soft. So whenever you have an audit, uh, usually on, on a standard, a standard has a whole bunch of requirements. In an audit, they may audit you on just one or two of those requirements in that standard. So it's not, it's not going to be the whole standard either, right? So uh, this R soft basically tells you the, the 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 requirement, right? It tells you to, it asks you to explain your narrative of how you comply. So you explain yourself, and then it asks for you know evidence, whether it's your procedures. Your evidence, documentation, examples, pictures, for example, or that, that sort of thing. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, though, is just that, hey, as standards change, right, uh, within a three-year period, a standard could change its version 
well, it's up to you to keep up with that version up to that date. Or if you update a procedure, and you made a significant change. Well, that piece of evidence now has to make sure you got to make sure that evidence, you know, you show both versions if they fall within that compliance period. Not a hard thing to do if you're, you know, spending your eight hours, 12 hours a month looking, just looking at compliance, right? So, all right, next slide, please. So, again, there's different things to, to, to make sure, right? So, you have uh, day one compliance documentation. That's when you're finally, you know, you've done all this work in preparation to the day that you energize that device, right? And you're in service. You want to make sure that on day one, you've got everything ready to go, right? Documentation so and the scope. So you have your contractor, you have all of that information of the facility ratings, the uh, relay testing, and all of that um, evidence that goes along with that, right? Uh, interconnection requirements, everything's your operating procedures. Also, for example, all of your personnel training. That's another thing that's important. We'll talk about more that a little bit more later. But having your personnel on site that are going to be operating, that, for example, are going to be receiving calls from the TOP or the BA, well, they need to be t trained, right, on how to properly communicate uh, with your TOPs and BA. So, but that training is simple. And it's another example. Right? The other aspect here is include documented evidence, right? So, Things that are that see things like voltage right through and frequency right through capabilities, that's PRC 024. And all these standards, right? For example, all of these you get from the OEM or uh, from the equipment manufacturer. And you also get that from is verified through the contractor that did the uh, the relay test, uh, the settings, for example, engineering firm as well. So all of that, you know, comes together. And before you energize it, they have to test all this. And and then once they do energize it, they gotta go back and verify it. So all this documentation, right, is an important thing to keep. So that's one thing that you need to make sure you get on your contractors to have this documentation with uh, with them and they present it correctly. And you, you know, you withhold in the contract, you, you got to have a, a clause in there that, you know, part of that payment is withheld until, you know, you get that final documentation as correct and verified and that they, they, they stay around for available for a good 30 days or, six, or two months until you get all this compliance evidence and squared away and, and, and properly properly documented and sorted, right? One of the things I've seen has really, been really, really bad is that uh, we've had a couple of clients at some point that they had over 340 pages of prints, test records and all that, all scanned you know, in one long PDF. And some of those documents were not OCR, meaning that they're not optical character recognition. So you cannot do a control F or a control find. And that they, they, they weren't even properly properly like, uh, even on the margins, right? They, they were really bad scans. So when you show that to your auditor, you know, they're, it's, it, it's going to present problems. So so again, not only must you ask for the right evidence, but the evidence has to be in the right format, right? Because it's really you know, nice, legible, nice nice files that is uh, properly set up because that, that, that whole sticking all 300 pages into a scanner and then here you go as a PDF, it's, it's the absolute worst way to do this. And then, of course, the interconnection studies satisfy model requirements, right? So, again, that mod 2032, uh, your interconnection requirements, right, on that agreement, they before you connect anyway, you, you're going to have to have all these studies done. So, and then your, your interconnection agreement, right, the TOP, the RTO, the BA, all of those have those requirements that you have to adhere to. And for the most part, right, a lot of them also make sure that you're going to have that as evidence. So, make sure you have that uh, properly carried out. Which you're gonna do anyway, right? So just and then most of them are already compliant. So just make sure you store that as well as that. Again, manufacturer data required. So so again, they like I said earlier, make sure you hold them accountable for all this compliance evidence. Like I said earlier, make sure that 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 that's part of the contract. And then the other thing is negotiate a post commission time frame, right? So you got to make sure that they they are available for some time afterwards to make sure that they can correct any issues, whether it's with the equipment or the documentation because that is important evidence you need. You know, we have so many examples of, of like OEMs disappearing and offering no help to their client once they've you know, commissioned it and given them all the evidence. So controls, right? A lot of that, it, it's just a matter of making sure everything in the compliance program. So when you set up your compliance program, there's a lot of different ways to capture all that evidence. Your procedures are controls. Training, of course, is important to make sure you, that you're within the compliance program. And then, of course, you want to test the right that compliance evidence that's that that's being captured correctly. Uh, your procedures, for example, you're going to have either either an operations procedure. It tends to be pretty pretty short, 
or you can have a training reference that had that explains more of a background as to why, right? What you don't ever want to do is you don't ever want to grab like the NERC standard and then copy it verbatim as your procedure. That is the worst thing you can do. Uh, and I've seen entities do that, and that that usually gets gets the auditors rolling their eyes and okay, let's see, it. show me your evidence now and see what you got. And usually that they find a problem with that. Just show me your procedure, how you really do it, and then maybe as an appendix you can show, hey, this procedure is written to comply with this evidence here, right? So training, I said that already, right? So uh, consistent training. So your personnel, whether it's your high level leadership or all the way down to your to your to your mechanics or anyone doing the, the, the control center of, the, of these sites. Uh, training is important to make sure they understand what the what your compliance burden is, what your responsibilities are, and whether it's cybersecurity, whether it's communications. Very important, uh, there are certain requirements specific to communications that have to do with uh, talking with um, control centers. So that they have to be trained on and certified before they actually serve. And there's many ways to deliver this training, right? So for us, we we whether it's computer based, is it a webinar, micro learning? So we have all this different availability, right? One of the things that we do is we also do audit prep. We we get your subject matter experts ready for these audits. And the most important thing at the bottom is new hire, right? NERC one hundred and one is is to make sure that they understand whether you're about to be a, a facility that's about to become uh, NERC compliant, or you have a new person, new personnel that you want to get them ready. Well, this this training is really important, and of course, that you retain evidence for that. And look at that; I think we made it to the end, just another thirty minutes. But um, again, we really, really condensed this. Uh, this presentation was a little longer when I had the other webinar. But if you have any questions, feel free to uh, reach out to us. Thank you, and thank you for today's show.